Okay, we're live. So here's another edition of Forward Progress. This is my show on Thursdays where I interview somebody in the industry uh, that's got some information that you need to know. And today I've got Thomas Shaw with Rock US here about, and we're going to be talking all about our apparel post production stuff. But before we get into that, let's just say hey. So what's going on today, Thomas? Marshall, I'm uh, I'm really excited to join you. We've uh, you know you and I have talked about this on a few different occasions, and uh, what an exciting topic for for our business owners. Yeah, usually when I see you, we're at a trade show <laughs> <laughs> or a bar. What, we're right. neither we're neither today. So yeah, either way, I'm always a little worse for the wear, but today I'm feeling feeling pretty good. <laughs> right, and uh, so just so everybody knows, uh, why don't you give them just kind of the background of what you do. And what and where we you know you live in uh, Portland, Oregon, right? So talk about what's going on with you and where you live and what you do. Absolutely. Um, so I'm a part of the team uh, here here at Rock US. Um, we distribute and sell the Rock equipment uh, throughout North America. Um, and you know, just this last year, we've not not only are we selling automated screen printing machines, but we're selling you know into this fulfillment market and pre press and. And really, just helping these business owners run a you know a lean operation and and uh, you know making their dreams come true. That's awesome. That's awesome. So we got a couple people that are on the uh, the presentation here. So we want to say hi. So Cindy's watching as she always does on YouTube, uh, <laughs> and Cindy's an embroiderer, Thomas. So some of the stuff we're going to talk about today isn't only for screen printers. So we just want to make that clear. Uh, Brian uh, says hello from Missouri. Artem is up where you live, right? So how's it going? And then Gosta is watching again from uh, Uppsala, Sweden. So uh, thank you so much for joining us, and I'm so happy you're here. So uh, again, any of you guys watching, if you've got a question, please, please, please uh, type it in there. And if you're also watching, we'd love to see – and hear from you. So make sure you let us know that you're here. Um, and if you're not watching live, um, leave a question or a comment and tag myself or Thomas. I'm sure we will ha be happy to answer you. Right, right Thomas? You'll, you'll answer Absolutely. a question later, right? Absolutely. All right, great. And uh, Mike's, Mike's here from California. So uh, right. hope you're doing good today, Mike. All right. So you ready to get going with our discussion topic? Let's talk about it. All right. So today we're talking about your favorite flavor of cheesecake. No, no, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the need for post-production work has increased. So uh, what's going on with this, Thomas? Marshall, I, you know, I have seen since the beginning of this year, um, I've seen this, this post-production field grow by leaps and bounds. I mean, as as Americans, we're spending more time in front of our phones and ordering things and having having one-off garments sent to us. Um, you know, basically this e-commerce market as well is is blowing up as well uh, too. So people are you know people are are shipping and receiving goods at a rate that has never you know we've never recorded anything like this. Yeah, it's it's just amazing when you think about it. And uh, I'm looking ahead right now, which is something that is good and bad, I think, but looking ahead to this holiday season, and I can't think of anybody that's going to go to the mall to, to buy anything, right? That's just not going to happen. We're going to be ordering from someone's website and or online store or whatever, which means that somebody's going to have to pick it. Somebody's going to have to box it up. Someone's got to ship it to me. And that's what we're talking about today. And of course, we're all in the apparel industry. So this is really about uh, you know, the folding, the hang tagging, the stickering, the poly bagging, the putting the insert in. It's This is what we're talking about today. And I think it really matters more than ever because it's a differentiator between you and the other guy. It's a point of branding. It's a point of, um, it's almost like uh, it's a table stakes now having a nice package, don't you think? Absolutely. And Marshall, I mean, the most exciting part about this is it's not just for, you know, these big contract screen printers. It's it's for the shop that, you know, with with, you know, five heads of embroidery or or, you know, two two small screen printing machines. I mean, this this fulfillment, uh, you know, it reaches across our entire industry. 
Right. Oh, and Cindy wants us to know that they do screen printing too. She just stays in the sewing case, right? So anyway, that, that's great. And so one of the things I uh, really appreciate about this is the fact that, you know, let's say, uh, you know, like Cindy or some of the people watching, I mean, they're not, you know, they're not in a 200,000 square foot facility and they're not doing 20 million shirts a year. They're cranking out stuff for their local business or that high school or that uh, civic organization or the fundraiser for uh, that nonprofit that's in their area, right? How can what we're talking about today, the post-production stuff, really help elevate that order? And why should these people, you know, even be offering this to their clients? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, whenever whenever people are offering a service like fulfillment, I mean, you you have the ability to impact your customer from the second that they open something up. So you can create an experience for that person. And, and, you know, you and I have talked about it, but I mean, you know, there are so many different ways you have to wow your customer and to, to win them over as a, as a, you know, a permanent, permanent customer of your own. Um, so, you know, whether it's something personally branded, whether it's, uh, you know, a, a bumper sticker or, uh, you know, basically a QR code that they can scan, like, uh, a scent, a scent that you put on the garment. So whenever they open it up, they smell something that reminds them of that experience and the ability to create that and to, to give that is really, you know, if you master that, th then, then people are, people are going to come back to you. Yeah. Right. And um, so is uh, maybe everybody's kind of doing this a little bit, but maybe they're not doing as well as they need to. Right. And uh so what are some things that they should be really doing and thinking about here? Yeah, in terms of uh, in terms of this, I mean, you know, basically not only should you be thinking about how it applies to the customers that you have, but you should be manifesting the type of customer that you want to go after and that you that you would see that can benefit from this. And so many people say, like, you know, my current customer base doesn't have a huge need for it. And the, the answer is to, you know, to evolve and to go out and find it because this is a multi-billion dollar industry and, and it is, it, you know, the business is out there. You just have to adapt and, and find it. Yeah. And, and I think that's exactly right. So let's just take, you know, uh, that whole idea of adding more things to the cart, for example, right? So you've got a customer that orders a thousand shirts, you print them, you order them or whatever you do, and you put it in a box and ship it, Right whatever you charge, that's the money you get. Now you're doing that same order for a thousand shirts, but instead of sending them the thousand shirts, you're going to do a custom uh, packaging. You're going to maybe do a hang tag on it with a uh, call to action or something on it. And then instead of sending one box to one person, you're sending it to a thousand different people and now you, the value that you add to your customer is the fact that they've got the shirts printed and you took a, take care of everything for them and it got sent off to somebody. And now the value of the order, you know, what was in your cart, so to speak, is, you know, it's, it's a huge factor that's added to that. So this drives more revenue to your business. This drives more profit to your business. This makes you stickier to your client because frankly, they don't have time and or because right now because of covid they're probably running at half speed anyway so this allows you to be a little stickier to them and a more valued partner and so instead of only looking for businesses where we can get the apparel decoration order we should be trying to find customers that have the need for this type of stuff so we can increase the value for the order we can be making more profit and then at the end of the day, we're, we're a more successful company. Absolutely. I mean, you know, you think about the different types of clients there are. I mean, uh, you know, we we should be the professionals in this field as business owners. Um, we shouldn't be relying on, you know, baseball coaches or people, you know, people that are creating their own clothing brand. We should do, let them use their time to do what they do best, which is create and network and and pitch their own their own uh, their own mission. And so we have to be the trusted advisor on this. Right, right. So let's get to the next topic, which is really about scheduling the work. And I think this is really the two most important things here is about capacity and velocity. And so when we think about doing the post-production on apparel, how long do things take? How long does it take you to 
do the decoration part, right? Because that takes time, right? And then also, what are you doing at the end of that? So let's say you've got to add a hologram sticker to every shirt, right? Are you doing it as it's coming down the belt or as it's on the embroidery uh, machine? When are you putting that on? Or are you having to touch the shirt again? What about the hang tag? What about the poly bag? What about the folding? What about, you know, some custom where you roll the shirt up and wrap it up with a rubber band with the hat, right? All of that stuff that we do in post-production all takes time. And if we don't understand that, it's really hard to schedule. And typically what I hear from a lot of people is they can't keep the schedule because um, they're sometimes printing the shirts the same day it's shipping. And then they got to do this post-production stuff. And that's why, that's why it's like a day or two late when they finally get it done because they didn't do a good enough job understanding the, the capacity and velocity of what's going on with this kind of stuff. So from, from your perspective, because you sell equipment, right? What do you advise your customers when they think about that as the number, the output per hour and that kind of stuff? What do you talk about? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, we run into, obviously, with capital equipment costs, I mean, these machines are, uh, you know, they're, they're anywhere from 50000 to $150,000 plus, right? Just the more advanced these, these systems get. Um, you know, and you're, you know, so you kind of have this fine balance that you're doing. Uh, you know, our, our units run roughly 6,000 pieces in a 10-hour shift. Um, so if your daily daily requirement is 12,000 pieces, you need to be looking at running multiple shifts or running multiple machines. And that really, that that differs on, on a lot of different things. So like, you know, if you're in a part of the country where labor costs are, are low, uh, you might benefit from running two shifts. If you need to be, you know, if labor costs are super high and you need to be, need to be producing more in a 10 hour shift, or you don't want to run two, then maybe maybe you look at investing more in the capital equipment than anything. Um, the biggest thing, like you said, is, is um, you know, planning for the future and, and making sure you have a solution that is, uh, that is either modular or has the ability to evolve as technology changes and customers' needs change. Right. And a lot of times it's also about, you know, your workflow, right? Because I've yeah. been to shops where they have the shirts come off the belt, then it goes right onto the auto bagger and boom, 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 then it's boxed up and it's not put on a separate cart or skid. You know, you've been to that. You've been to shops like that before, right? That's all about that one piece flow rather than touching it 16 times. Yeah. I mean, uh, like the principle of lean manufacturing, right? Is like how how quickly can we get to an end result and how and can we reduce the amount of times that we're handling something? And, and the people that are doing that are the people that are going to really benefit and make money off of this. Yeah. So we have a couple of comments here. I want to throw that up here. Uh, David Egger says an auto bagger with a customer label that is applied to each bag. I think he meant custom really increases value and customer satisfaction for the customer to return the customer to market view via word of mouth. And I think that's, that's a great point. And it's because uh, you're, you're a little stickier, right? And, uh, and it's not like every other t-shirt you get. And, uh, but just because it looks nicer and frankly, to me, Anything that's embroidered should be polybag because it has a higher perceived value anyway. And so right after we steam the shirt to get the hoop mark out, you know, and we've we've trimmed it, it goes right, it gets folded, goes right in a bag, and then we box it up just because it makes it look so much nicer and the perceived value of that item is much higher. Yep. Yeah, it's um, you know, it's it's an amazing experience that you can provide, especially like you said, it's perceived value. And if something comes to you and whenever you open it up, the feeling that you get, um, you know, paying paying a little bit extra for that is, you know, the the value of that is, I mean, you can't even put a number on it to me. Right, right. And so when we're thinking about scheduling this stuff, I think you really got to look at the number of steps that we have to do, right? And so uh, we'll say a typical order uh, has to be folded, it has to be poly bagged. Maybe you're adding a hang tag label in the neck or under the, you know, the armpit there, right? When are we doing these things, right? So we really need to hang tag that shirt before we fold it and bag it. So is that being, is that being hang tagged right there at the end of the dryer belt? Is that a separate step over here in post-production? 
And then do you have a handgun or do you have an automatic thing that's air driven? You know, there's, there's a million ways that you guys can be doing this stuff, but truly understanding what your throughput is per hour, your labor, how are you setting up for that? Um, you know, I've been in um, some shops in California where they just had a whole lot of people. And as the shirts are coming down the dryer belt, uh, somebody was putting a hologram on it. Somebody was hang tagging it. And it actually went into, they just had the, the flip fold thing. Boop, 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 and it went into a poly bag and it was bagged up and was put in a box. Yeah. It, it, it never left that area. It was bagged up right there exactly how it needed to be. And, and more so we, you know, we definitely saw, uh, we saw a need for the machine side of this, this, I mean, for, for years, years coming. Um, but just even since, uh, the start of 2019, um, you know, we've, uh, I've seen a lot of, a lot of these different things becoming automated. I mean, we, we now have automation and, you know, packing multiple garments per bag. We have automation with applying a hologram label, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, we've even gone so far as to, uh, test and, and put the machines in the field that are putting a folded tagged and tagged garment into a poly mailer and printing variable data. Uh Oh, Thomas's internet just crapped out. <laughs> well, let's hope he comes back. Um, that's not good. Hey, you never know what's going to happen with a live show. So uh, all he has to do is log back in and click the link. So uh, I'm sure he's sweating bullets on his end. So while uh, I'm waiting on him, so let's stall for a minute. And do you guys have any questions? Can you type them in the comments and that way maybe I can help you answer. And by the time he comes back, we'll have some things to talk about. Uh, in the meantime, um, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's talk about, um, let's go to the next thing and really talk about expectations on automating this task. Cause that's kind of where we were going with it. And I'll just kind of like give you my take. Um, which is really about uh, getting uh, more things through the pipe. And so uh, if you're building uh, and you have a need for sales and you have a need to get this stuff handled, you're really going to want to automate this as much as possible uh, just because it's going to allow you to do it with less labor. It's easier for your crew. Uh, you know, using that flip fold thing is, is, is pretty easy, but when you got 10,000 shirts to do or something, it, it becomes kind of a, uh, a challenge, right? And um, so it's just, you got to like kind of look at that. And and so what makes sense for you? I think if you're looking at automating that with a machine, and this is where Thomas would come in here, um, we could look at our ROI on the throughput and then we could get it down to a reasonable number when, you know, uh, 18 months or so that machine's paid off. And oh, he's back. I am back. Yeah, I there he is. Can you hear me? I can. Yep. Great. So um, what I was talking about was really about the expectations on automating the task from a return on investment standpoint. So uh, you sell this equipment, right? So what should somebody be looking at to really say, hey, that's in my ballpark. I need that. Where should they be with the volume to make sure that machine makes sense? Absolutely. Um, so, you know, these customers, uh, you know, if you're in an area with super high labor costs, it's obviously going to speed up kind of your, your production numbers. But I mean, anybody who is, who is planning on, on poly bagging, you know, over 1500 to 2000 pieces a day, or even, even less than that, you know, uh, depending on how many people you have on the floor, I mean, you should really be considering this. We're looking at a, uh, we're looking at a monthly leasing payment of, you know, anywhere from fifteen hundred to twenty five hundred dollars a month. And I mean, you know, if you compare that towards labor, you're looking at maybe replacing one employee on the ROI. Right, right. And uh, so Brian had a question here. Uh, what do the machines take specific bags? And they do, Brian. <laughs> so, um, and you and there's multiple people that source them. So what do you guys do, Thomas? Uh, great question. So a lot of machines on the market will require specific bags for T-shirts, hoodies, you know, kids' garments, whatever it is. 
Uh, we, we offer something a little bit different. So instead of having to stock those on your floor, uh, we offer plastic rolls that are welded to size. So our machine will read, read the entry and the exit of a garment and we'll create a bag to that specific size. Um, and, you know, th so there are options out there for hoodie bags, t-shirt bags and things like that. Our machine just takes a little bit of a different approach and creates the bag and welds it on site. I like that a lot. You know, I've used the Askomatic uh, folder bagger, which is probably the most common. Mm -hmm. And that takes a wicketed bag. So it's kind of like a, it's got these little metal posts that jam in. And I actually have sourced the bags with the size label on it. So I don't have to add a sticker because it already mm -hmm. says it's a medium. And that was a really good solution for that. And I had the child proof warning disclaimer thing already printed on the bag, which is a, a pretty much a default these days, I'd say. And um, so it's just, it's an easy way of doing it. I like the fact that you've got a piece of the equipment that it's more versatile because you've got, a, it's a sheet of plastic that's going to be folded around the garments and that way it's more versatile and you don't have to stock 2 million SKUs of stuff. You only really have to order rolls of uh, plastic, right? Absolutely. And the, the plastic industry is, um, it is also something that's adapting and changing. I mean, now you have offerings like eco-friendly bags, right? So if you have a customer, oh, who's, really, yeah. So if you have a customer who is very eco-focused, you can provide something for them. Um, in addition to that, you know, uh, you know, plastics. Plastic is a cost, right? So the idea is, if you're folding a youth garment but you're putting it in a hoodie bag, you're probably spending more than you would if you had. Right if you had bags or you're worried about stocking levels on the floor and things like that of a certain size or a certain, certain configuration. And, um, you know, we just know that, uh, that the more that your customer will change. So that's why we kind of adapted the custom bag size. So the sustainable plastic, is that like plant-based or is that recycled poly? What is, what is that? Yeah. So many people are doing plant-based, uh, plant-based products. And some people are doing like, uh, recycled ocean plastics into bags. Um, that industry is still somewhat of a, a new industry, but, um, you know, obviously like our industry has a responsibility to start looking towards becoming more and more sustainable. Well, yeah, we're, we're beyond, uh, like I think oil drilling, <laughs> You know, a garment in apparel, I think, is the second worst polluters in the whole world. We, so. we make quite the mess, yeah. <laughs> so we should be doing more, people. <laughs> All right, so, and uh, Yosta wants to know, uh, polybag one or one in a pack? I think you probably pretty answered his question, I'd imagine. Um, and then uh, Brian says, I heard people discuss that plastic bags are banned in their area unless they're sustainable. That's why I mentioned it. Good point, Brian. So if that's true, you sh you could source a plant-based thing because it's not plastic. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And then and does, uh, does, does Ryanet sell that or is that another vendor? It is uh, in development. We don't sell it right now, but we have had conversations across the board. I mean, it's kind of a race to the finish line. Um, in that and people are weighing out cost versus, versus benefit and somebody's going to get there and that market will, will take off, I'd say, uh, within the, the next 365 days, probably. Okay, great, great. And um, so let's uh, get this one. And this is the most important, I think, which is post-production as a profit center. Because, and, and uh, like I was mentioning before we jumped on the thing today, it was just me and you privately. You know, we don't do this because we're altruistic. We do this because we want to make money. <laughs> so if uh, I'm not really doing this full time and I'm only just printing the shirts or embroidering the shirts and I'm looking at maybe adding fulfillment to my arsenal, mm -hmm. what is the what's the money opportunity? What could I be making here? Do you have examples of that or do you know it, something? Uh, so, I mean, people are... Uh, it, it, there's really two different camps and we talked about this earlier. There's the, the contract guys who are making, you know, maybe once, once they're, they balance their books and counted in labor or machine costs and things like that, you know, they might be benefiting, they might be gaining 25 cent per bag, um, you know, uh, or 10 cent a bag. So, you know, some of those guys that are these large fulfillment companies and contract printers, they're making very little per, per garment. 
Now the guys that are creating um, experiences for their customer, I mean, sometimes their their profits are upwards of you know three dollars a bag, two dollars a bag sometimes. And, and how are they doing that? They're they're doing it by offering an additional service, so a way to connect the customer with the brand that they're buying from. So they're doing things like printing QR codes on the bags, or offering a custom printed bag, or special edition or special releases on the bags, and and um, you know, so obviously it's a little bit different. The guys, what what is scary about the contract market and the guys that are doing a ton of this stuff is uh, when you're selling to certain retailers or certain customers, there are, uh, you assume a risk and that risk is something known in the industry as chargebacks. And these chargebacks, I mean, whenever you sign contracts with some of these large companies, these chargebacks can can be anything. They can be, you know, a misplaced label or hang tag that, that you would then get charged for. Um, if it's a, a difference in in the type of seal that you made or a hole in the bag, I mean, these are these are risks that these contract shops assume, and they have to implement like quality control uh, protocols that are that are very very strict. Right. So if you're re really looking at equipment or looking at sourcing bags or whatever, you want to make sure that everything falls in line with this stuff, so you don't get nailed with the chargebacks. And I've done some stuff for retailers, and I know a lot of times. You know, a lot of their profit comes from the chargebacks more so than the garments that are selling in the stores. It's insane. Right? Yeah, Marshall. I mean, I've seen anywhere from you know penalties of three, three hundred, four hundred dollars plus per per chargeback. Yeah, it's insane. Uh, I went to this one retailer um, uh, contract shop in California, uh, like it was forever ago. But uh, what was impressive to me was the fact that. Uh, they photograph every single thing they do on every single order and all the images go to this folder on a server somewhere because they want to prove on their end that they're doing everything that need to be doing because they know somebody's going to say, uh-uh, the hang tag wasn't on the shirt. Yeah. Absolutely. And so what they do is they just film all that stuff and it's poor that job and they have a record of every single thing that they did so that they could say, uh-uh, you're, you're wrong. This is what, how we do it. And um, so that was very interesting. And uh, it's kind of an aside more than anything. But um, so when we're, let's say that we need to be selling this stuff, Thomas. Do you have any tips on just how to get this business? Because I think a lot of people aren't going to come in doing huge numbers, right? They're going to have to work their way into it. So what is some of the language that they should use because what we want to be doing is building this business up, obviously. So do you have any tips on what some of your customers are doing and how they've gotten the business? Absolutely. Um, a couple of the guys that I work with, and especially the people that are that are running our automated equipment, some of the larger solutions, um, these guys, they they bring this example to a client meeting, even if it's not even if it's not direct directly applicable towards what they're talking about that day. They might bring a bring a sample or uh, an example of a kit and show it to somebody who you know who basically maybe they maybe that contract client doesn't need it but maybe they know somebody who needs it um, and so just talking about it getting the word out there that you even have the ability to do it is a big deal. Um, another thing that I think is is very important whenever you're talking about this is to be be the professional on it and tell these people you know like let me handle this for you because it, there's no doubt that these guys have rushed to UPS to ship out a product or received an email because they got busy with their kids' baseball practice and didn't ship something out. Um, and, you know, they, it's their name on the line and they, they want their reputation to be solid. So tell them, you know, hey, like, let me take care of this for you because this is what we do for a living. And um, mm -hmm. that's, that's yeah. the way to relate. Yeah, we can be more than just apparel decorators, right? In fact, I was talking with somebody the other day Actually, decorating the shirt is often just the easiest part of the whole process, right? It's everything else that's so complicated. <laughs> so, uh, and then so if we do a really good job with all the other stuff, you know, here our discussions about post production, right? We become more valuable to our customers because they don't want to monkey around with this stuff. Right. Nobody wants to get 500 shirts and have to split it off and do stuff and do the shipping and whatever. You know, that used to be how everything used to work. You know, 10 years ago, everything used to go to a distribution center and that's how it would work. Now we're the distribution center. 
Yep. Right. And, and so this is how you really um, how you really matter and how you get better clients is because you understand all this stuff and you've got uh, a post-production and you've got uh, shipping and you do uh, inventory picks and you just, you just add more services and you can build up better revenue and get better clients sometimes. So. Yeah. It's, you know, um, it's amazing. And like I said, I mean, I, I think our, the biggest advantage that you can have is to, to be aware of what's going on uh, in the industry as a whole. I mean, there are issues right now with just the, with USPS, right? The United States Postal Service is running into issues with delayed packages and products being delivered late and everything, funding issues. And so if you know that, you know, it's, it's your duty to tell your customer that this is what's going on. And you can provide value by saying like, hey, I, I know that this is going on. Let me guarantee your package in two to three days, you know? And, and these people would, I mean, it, it, they want to protect protect their identity and their brand, and and you just have to be there for them. Yeah, and uh, we won't uh, have any political uh, <laughs> things. What's going on? Because we want to keep this a family friend, friendly, non uh, uh, profanity <laughs> show. So, um, hey, we're we're winding up in a little bit. So if you've got a question for either myself or Thomas, can you add it uh, to the link there? Uh, and we'll be happy to get to it. So um, uh, also, uh, let's talk about uh, skill level running this equipment, right? Is this really hard to learn? I mean, can how long does it take to get up? Let's just say I bought a brand new machine, right? How long does it take me to get up and running and know how to use it? Is it as difficult as an embroidery machine or a screen printing machine? It, um, it, it, it has a lot of the same nuances. Right. Um, so, you know, if the best way to, to make sure that these things have uptime is to be familiar with the machine, be familiar with what your preventative maintenance is, um, and then just spend time with us at the install. So we do a uh, we do anywhere from eight to 16 hours on site um, of actually training on the unit. Um, that being said, I've been in shops with uh, a brand new employee and that employee was averaging 600 to 700 pieces per hour on his, you know, his first day of the job. Okay. Well, that's pretty good. Yeah. So really just knowing your machine and, and, um, and managing expectations in terms of, you know, what you can produce in a day and just not, not getting in over your head, like you said earlier. All right. Cool. Well, I wanted to share some things. Um, Thomas made a really nice report and this is where it's linked to. And it's got some, he did some research uh, and this is all about numbers and data and that kind of thing. So if you want to learn about, where this industry is going for fulfillment and post-production, uh, this would be something that you can download. And, uh, you know, if you got any questions, I'm sure he'll happily answer that because uh, he did all the work on that, not me. <laughs> so, um, and can you just let people kind of know what's in that report real quick? Absolutely. Um, so we talk a little bit about, obviously, the, the change in the market this year, which, you know, COVID-19 uh, basically... Uh, it's it has forced this industry to to shift. I mean, very quickly towards you know us being the provider and us us providing fulfillment services. Um, it talks a little bit about that. It also talks about um, you know onshoring, bringing production back to the states, which you know the trend was the opposite in the you know early late '90s. You know, all business was going overseas. It's now starting to come back, and and you know we're producing, manufacturing, and fulfilling stateside. Um, you know, go into a little bit about, um, you know, leasing payments and how to balance those versus production output and, you know, machine costs. And what, what I believe is important whenever you're looking at machines and fulfillment machines, and, you know, holes not to get sucked into whenever you're looking at different options. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think outside of that, just basically, uh, basically talking about how to streamline it and minimize touch points and running a lean, lean fulfillment center. Um, and then the last page is what we just covered, which is, you know, how do we make money off of this and how do we, um, you know, how do we, how do we take it, take our piece of the pie? Um, because this business is out there and somebody's going to, somebody is going to make money off of it. Right. Right. Yeah. And I was talking with somebody the other day and they were saying, nobody's buying right now. And my comment back to them was like, well, everybody's buying. They're just not buying from you. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. There's different people buying. Your customer that you had back in February or January, they not might not be around right now. There's new people. There's new companies. There's new needs because the world has changed. 
And, um, and I think post-production and fulfillment is a big part of that landscape for this industry, you know, for a long time to come. So you should be really looking at that. Um, all right. So uh, if anybody wants to get a hold of uh, Thomas, here's his address. It's probably the shortest email address I've seen in a long time. So uh, <laughs> usually they're big, long, big, long uh, emails. Um, so uh, any last minute uh, things to add here? Really just, um, you know, I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in today. I mean, it's what a great platform and what an exciting topic to talk about. I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that aren't so fun to talk about going on, but this is something that, I mean, this is exciting and it should be exciting for these people. And, and, you know, we should, if you're not, if you're not considering it today, you know, you, you need to, you need to really get this on your radar. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, Thomas. Appreciate you. And, and again, if anybody has a question or a comment or anything, and you're watching this, especially if you're watching this recorded, just leave something in the comment, regardless of what channel you're watching this on, and we'll get back to you. So thanks, everyone, for watching. And have a fantastic uh, weekend, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Marshall. Thank you.